we've been talking about who Jesus is, his story, and then our story being like his. Today we're going to look at Philippians 3, 7 through 11. Jesus is called the, the suffering servant. And as our story is like his, it means that his sufferings are, are our sufferings as well. Philippians 3, we're going to start at verse 7. But whatever was to my profit, I now consider loss for the sake of Christ. What is more, I consider everything a loss compared to the surpassing greatness of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, for whose sake I have lost all things. I consider them rubbish, that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not in a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness that comes from God and is by faith. I want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of sharing in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, and so somehow to attain to the resurrection from the dead. So when you put your faith in Jesus Christ, you don't just believe in him, you don't just believe that he was a real person, you take on who he was and who he is. You take on his life, you take on his death, you take on his resurrection, his mission, his sufferings, his inheritance, his privilege, and his story becomes your story too. And as the suffering servant, we have this passage here, which is fascinating to me in verses 10 and 11 I want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of sharing in his sufferings becoming like him in his death and so somehow to attain to the resurrection from the dead there's a there's a desire to participate in the sufferings that Christ suffered because of the resurrection that he had So what are these sufferings? Well, Jesus, he faced all the sufferings of body without losing focus on his father. If you look at his life and what the Bible says about him, he suffered all of the things that we suffer. That means he knew hunger, thirst, exhaustion, and sickness, among other things. In Luke 4, verse 2, it talks about how he was in the wilderness. It says, for 40 days he was tempted by the devil. He ate nothing during those days, and at the end of them he was hungry. So he knew what hunger was. And then when he came to the woman at the well, it says Jacob's well was there, and Jesus, tired as he was from the journey, he was exhausted. Sat down by the well. It was the sixth hour when the sun was highest in the day. When a Samaritan woman came to draw water, Jesus said to her, will you give me a drink? He was thirsty. And then Matthew 8, 17. I like the way it says this. He took up our infirmities and carried our diseases. He took upon them upon himself. He left a a perfect heaven for all of this. He, he could have just stayed up there in, in his throne and, and ruled the world in, in perfect bliss and harmony with the Father and the Spirit. And he came to this broken world. And then all of these ailments he took on himself. It comes with a sinful territory that he entered. In a world under sin, he was subject to decay and death, just like all of us are. So he faced all of these sufferings of body, and he, he faced them all. He didn't lose focus on his father. These only surfaced from time to time. He never got bogged down in them. He never got consumed by them. He kept his focus on his father the whole time. And he became poor that we might become rich. 2 Corinthians 8 verse 9 it says, for you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, so that through his poverty you might become rich. If you think about all that he left in heaven so that we would be saved, 
at his unbelievable amount of sacrifice that he went through just to even walk this earth. Talk about a step down. He left what was perfect. He gave up absolutely everything to save us. Absolutely everything. So he left his heavenly throne for swaddling clothes. You know the, the story of Christmas? He was wrapped in swaddling clothes and placed in a manger. Back then they thought that babies would grow better if they were stiff as a board. And so when it says he was wrapped in swaddling clothes, that means he was wrapped up real tight like a mummy. And so he went from being king of the whole universe and omnipotent, can do anything, to not even being able to move his arms. He was trading a crown of heaven for a crown of thorns. He was a king, and he instead became a slave. He was eternal, and he became temporal. And he was in the form of God, but he became the form of a servant. It's baffling to think what he had and what he gave up. And he gave it up, not just because, but he gave it up to save us. He faced and overcame some powerful temptations, too. He faced down pride, hate, lust, greed, envy, gluttony, and all of these things that we face. He faced them, too. He knows what it means to be tempted. Hebrews 4.15, we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who has been tempted in every way just as we are, yet was without sin. He knows what it's like. He knows what it's like to struggle with these things, and to get caught up in them. He could have used his power for personal gain to satisfy his hunger, but he didn't. He could have manipulated the father by jumping off the highest point of the temple like Satan tempted him to do. But the most powerful temptation that he overcame was that he could have escaped the cross at any time. At any time during his life, all the way up until when he died, he could have escaped. He could have hit that abort button, that eject button, and he could have said, you know what, I'm not up for that. So at Gethsemane, he says, may that cup pass from me, but not as I will, but as you will. He could have passed that cup. He could have. When he was arrested, he could have called 12 legions of angels to save him. When he was resurrected, there was an angel that appeared, and all of the soldiers there just fainted out of fear. Out of one angel, let alone 12 legions. At his trial, he was innocent. He could have easily defended himself, and he was silent. He didn't stand up for himself. And on the cross, he could have come down at any time. He was taunted the entire time. If you are the Son of God, then come down from the cross. He could have. At any time, he could have not done that mission. He could have opted for something else. He could have opted for earthly glory, earthly wealth, and earthly fame, and all of that this world has to offer, and he didn't. He chose the way of suffering to save us. His obedience to his father led to insults, rejection, shame, and abuse. He was just doing what his father asked him to do, And he encountered all kinds of rejection and problems because of it. His own people tried to seize him and stone him more than a couple times. You'll do that reading on Thursday. His own town tried to throw him off a cliff because they didn't like what he had to say. His own family tried to take charge of him because they thought he was out of his mind. And he was stabbed in the back by his closest friends. He knows what it's like to be stabbed in the back. He was betrayed and handed over by a close friend. 
he was denied three times by maybe his best friend. And he was abandoned by all of his friends. It says all of the disciples deserted him and fled when he was arrested. All of them. In fact, one even fled naked because the guard had his cloak. He'll do anything to get away. He was being obedient to his father and he just suffered all this insult, rejection, shame, and abuse because of it. He was condemned to death for who he was, for telling the truth. Not because of anything he did. He was condemned for who he was. <coughs> he was the Son of God. And that, on that basis, we put him to death. John 19, 7. People before Pilate says, We have a law, and according to that law, he must die because he claimed to be the Son of God. He was telling the truth. He really was the Son of God, and on that basis, they killed him. So for who he was, for telling the truth, he was condemned to death. Now, Jesus, this is a true story here. This is not something that somebody made up. This really happened. And that means that there's a resurrection. And if there's a resurrection, that there are heavenly things to gain here in our lives. Things that what we have now can't compare to. Write this one underneath your, your fifth line if you're taking notes in your books there. He literally went through hell to bring us to heaven. On the cross, he said, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He was utterly forsaken by the Father. That's hell. That's what it is. Let's look at the screen here. Why does the Apostles' Creed add, He descended to hell? To assure me in times of personal crisis and temptation that Christ my Lord, by suffering unspeakable anguish, pain, and terror of soul, especially on the cross, but also earlier, has delivered me from the anguish and torment of hell. So his sufferings led to our redemption. Some of his sufferings we, we share in and we participate in, like Paul's talking about in Philippians 3. But this one, he went through so we wouldn't have to. As much as we might suffer in this life, we are never going to know what it means to be utterly forsaken by God. And thank God for that. He paid the full penalty for our sins, not just some of them, not most of them, all of them, so that we can be saved and we can be pardoned and forgiven. That's, that's his story. What's our story? There's some sufferings that we are going to face whether we're a Christian or not. Whether you believe in Jesus, whether you follow him and seek him, or if you don't, there are some things that are going to happen to you no matter what. And then there's other sufferings that we are going to face because we are Christians, because we follow him, because we seek his truth and who he is. So, no matter whether we're Christians or not, we are going to experience the sufferings of body like he did. And so, for our story, I will face sufferings of body without losing focus on him. These things are going to happen to us. They're going to happen to us whether we're Christians or not, whether we believe or not. We can avoid some of them through healthy living and being careful, but some of them are going to happen to us no matter what. So hunger and thirst, exhaustion, cuts and bruises, aging, sickness, infections, all of these things, these are going to happen to us. And because we follow Christ, we're going to face them like he did. We're going to face them and we're not going to get distracted by them. 
We're going to stay focused on who he is and what he represents and what he's done for us. These just come with being in a territory of a sinful world that's fallen and broken because of sin. But we're not going to be distracted by these things because there's bigger things involved. There's been many times when I've visited people in the hospital, people who are, are older and there's many things wrong with them, and then they just go on about how God is so good, how they have so much to be thankful for. And it's always eye-opening to see that. Because here's some people who have tons to complain about. And they're not exactly happy about where they are, what's going on, but they're not distracted by it. They're still giving thanks to God. They're still praising the Lord. And that's incredible to see. We're not going to be distracted by these things. Christ became poor so that we might become rich. So I'll suffer material goods and loss of them so that others might gain spiritual goods. In 2 Corinthians 8, we want you to know about the grace that God has given the Macedonian churches out of the most severe trial, their overflowing joy and their extreme poverty welled up in rich generosity. For I testify that they gave as much as they were able and even beyond their ability, entirely on their own. They urgently pleaded with us for the privilege of sharing in this service to the saints. So we have examples here of people who have nothing, and yet they are giving as much as they possibly can, and even more than they can. As believers, we see what Jesus gave up so that we would be saved, and we recognize that there are heavenly things to gain at the expense of material things. So we can give treasures of earth to gain treasures of heaven. Jesus told this short parable of, of this guy who was looking for buried treasure and he found some. He found some in a field and when he found it, he hid it again. And then in his joy, went and sold everything that he had to buy that field. It's easy to chase personal comfort. It's easy to chase personal achievements. But instead of those things, let's seek the advancement of the gospel. If you're somebody who tithes, you are effectively lowering your standard of living so that the gospel can go forth. So that Jesus can shine in more people's lives. We tend to get angry when people threaten or challenge our comforts. We take those pretty personally. We hang on to those pretty tightly. And yet Jesus, he let it all go. And he had far more than any of us have. And that's amazing. People get angry when you threaten their comforts and they are amazed when you voluntarily surrender yours. Let's look at the screen here again. What further advantage do we receive from Christ's sacrifice and death on the cross? Through Christ's death, our old selves are crucified, put to death, and buried with him, so that the evil desires of the flesh may no longer rule us, but that instead we may dedicate ourselves as an offering of gratitude to him. And so... His story becomes our story because he suffered and died on the cross. We will suffer and die to be rid of all of our earthly desires too. And so, I will suffer in resisting temptations. Not sinning is worth the pain. If you want to share in the sufferings of Christ, resist your temptations. And it's not going to feel good. Jesus in the desert, he showed us that pain is not the worst because he was suffering quite a bit there. Sin is the worst. There's nothing worse than that. 1 Peter 4, 1 through 2 says this, Therefore, since Christ suffered in his body, body arm yourselves 
also with the same attitude, because he who has suffered in his body is done with sin. As a result, he does not live the rest of his earthly life for the evil human desires, but rather for the will of God. So as you struggle against sin in your own life, the temptations that you have, it's going to hurt. It's not going to feel good. You are going to suffer because of it. But Jesus has shown us that it's totally worth it. Because the worst thing is to sin. That's the worst. And we can be forgiven of our sins, of course. But that doesn't mean we want to do them anymore. That doesn't mean we want to continue in them. We want to run from them as fast as we can. And yes, it's going to hurt. If you're trying to overcome pornography or drugs or compulsive eating or shopping or anything like that, that's going to hurt. There's going to be this void in your life. If you're avoiding fighting as much as possible, this is part of our, our creed in our martial arts class, I will avoid fighting as much as possible. Use my training only as a last resort. If, if you live by that, that means that you, if you're ever in a confrontation that does turn violent, you are going to take the first punch. If you're saying no to sex outside marriage, then you are going to face rejection and scorn. Maybe you've heard of somebody named Lolo Jones. Um, I have her on the screen here. Oops, there we go. She said this. She's still a virgin and she's a Christian and she says, it's just something, a gift I want to give to my husband. But please understand, this journey has been hard. If there's virgins out there, I'm going to let them know. It's the hardest thing I've ever done in my life. Harder than training for the Olympics, harder than graduating from college, has been to stay a virgin before marriage. If you're going to resist temptations, it's going to hurt. This is just one example. But it's totally worth it if you're following Christ, if you're seeking to share in his sufferings so that you can attain his resurrection from the dead. He was obedient and that obedience led to insults, rejection, shame, and abuse. And so, if that's what he was like, then I will suffer insults, shame, and abuse to obey him. To do what he did, to be like him in his death, I'm going to face insults and shame and abuse, scorn and rejection and laughter, mockery, whatever. Jesus stands for everything that the world doesn't want. When he came to this world, we, we rejected him because he meant a bunch of things that we don't like. It, Jesus means that we are sinners who must repent and change and must seek forgiveness from God. We're, we're wrong. We don't like that. Jesus means we can't save ourselves. We can't do it. Jesus means we have to seek forgiveness from God. We have to humble ourselves before God. We don't like that. We want to be able to do it ourselves. Jesus means that we have to love our neighbors and even our enemies like he did. We don't like that. And if you live by that, if you embrace who he was, people are going to reject you too. People aren't going to like that. It's going to go against the grain of the way this world works. And you don't have to look very far to see examples of this. So just for fun, I went and just collected some headlines from just things that have happened this past week. So I have four things up here. These are headlines that I came across of things that occurred just in the past week. So Princeton Seminary, they were going to give an award to a guy named Tim Keller. You probably have heard of him. He's a, he's a pretty neat guy. But a lot of their people who have been to that seminary support same-sex marriage. Tim Keller does not. And so they raised this uproar and said, we can't be giving an award to somebody who doesn't support that. They called it toxic theology. 
And so Princeton Seminary said, no, we're not going to give that award anymore. In Nigeria, in Boko Haram, there's this group called Boko Haram that's trying to take over that country. And there's all these Christian refugees that are fleeing that area because this group is so violent to them. And in these displacement camps, if they find out that you're a Christian, they deny you food when you're starving. And there's a pastor being held in Turkey because, because the United States is not handing over an imam that Turkey thinks is part of a revolt there. And then there's a place called Myanmar, also known as Burma. And the country there is constantly attacking the Christian minorities there because they see them as subversive to the government. And so there's tons of people fleeing their country. They're dropping everything and they're going somewhere else. If you're a Christian, you're going to suffer. People aren't going to like you. You're going to go against the grain of this world. People are going to see you as subversive and problem. And you're going to suffer. If you want to follow Christ, this is going to happen to you. And I, for one, am ready to suffer that. Jesus suffered for me. I am ready to go through that, those same sufferings for him because I know there's a resurrection at the end and that at the end, everything is going to be made right. And so that's what I hang on to. Jesus was sentenced to death for who he was. And so I will face death for who he is. This is a picture I came across. This man here is from Pakistan. Christians make up about 2% of that country. And lots of people in that country, if you're a Christian, you don't get a job or you lose your job or people steal from you and the police don't do anything about it. People might beat you up. They might drag you away and force you into a marriage that you're not, not wanting to be a part of. And here's this guy who's saying, live as a Christian, die as a Christian, proud to be Christian. And he's holding that sign up in public saying, I'm ready to die for my Savior. That's pretty cool. I want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of sharing in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, and so somehow to attain the resurrection from the dead. We don't have to be afraid to die. Because we know there's a resurrection. And if we're seeking to follow Jesus, and that happens to be very hazardous to us, to our health, or to our lives, it's totally worth it. Because there's a resurrection, suffering for Christ is always worth it. Always. There's a lot of suffering that comes because we're sinful, we do stupid things. But there's some suffering that comes because we're Christians and we follow him. So every month, as you see up there, 322 Christians are killed because of their faith. 214 churches and Christian properties are destroyed and 772 forms of violence are committed against Christians. Beatings, abductions, rapes, arrests, forced marriages. These are things that come to people because they call themselves Christians. They call Jesus as their Lord. And it's totally worth it. Why? Because there's a resurrection. The sufferings that we have in our life, they have a purpose they draw us to the Lord more. They help us understand Christ more because this was his life. And one day, they're going to mount up and achieve for us an eternal glory that's going to far outweigh any of them. If you believe that Jesus Christ died on the cross for you, and you call him your Lord and Savior, and you're seeking to follow him, then whatever you suffer in this life is going to be totally worth it. In the end, all of it will make sense. All of it will go to his glory and your finest hour. Just like it was with him.
cross should have been his ultimate moment of shame. It was his finest hour. We celebrate that today. That's us too. And so, as strange as it may sound, let's seek to know Christ, the power of his resurrection, and even the fellowship of sharing in his sufferings so that we can become like him in his death and achieve the resurrection from the dead. His story is our story. Let's bow our heads and let's pray. Father in heaven, Lord, your servant, Jesus Christ, your son, he is our example. His story is our story. We pray, O oh Lord, that we would seek him and that, Lord, whatever sufferings come because of that, we pray that we would be willing to face them and that, Lord, you would keep before our eyes that resurrection that motivated the Apostle Paul and that can motivate each one of us too. We pray, O oh Lord, that we would face all these sufferings, keeping our eyes focused on you and whatever you have for us. We know that there's a resurrection and we pray that we would just be able to concentrate on that. We pray in Jesus' name, amen.